Hello everybody. So I guess this is going to be kind of like a little sermon, little teaching, and I don't know for a fact if anyone has tied these two scriptures together before. I'm sure they must have. I'm sure somebody has, but, but anyway, so lately over the past, I don't know, a few weeks, the Lord has been punctuating the number 38 to me. Now, you guys, if you're following my channel, know that I just recently turned 38. But even before I turned 38, um, the number kind of was popping up. And, you know, re recently I did a video titled, Do You Want to Be Made Well? And I did a little teaching. And I was debating throwing this in there, but I hadn't quite... I don't know. I wasn't ready. So, um, but you know, when I was going over this passage in John chapter five, it stood out to me, you know, how God's word is. You, you, you can look at something so many times and it just, you know, never, you don't really notice it. And then one day, boom, you notice something. And all of a sudden I noticed that, you know, they mention. 38 years. Now, a certain man was there who had an infirmity 38 years. Verse 5. And the Holy Spirit kind of nudged me and reminded me that if it's in Scripture, if, if you know, specific details are in Scripture, they're there for a reason. Because there's many instances where specific details are not given. There's even, you know, instances where people's names aren't even given, never mind their age. And so I wasn't even like focusing on this. It was just kind of like rolling around in the back of my head while I've been focusing on other stuff. Um, but I was like, what's up with that? You know, like why, why the specific mention of, of this guy's age? You know, and I looked up the number 38 and the number 38 means purification slash sanctification. And I immediately connected it to, okay, I'm, I'm about to turn 38. And the concept of, you know, like an age or more more really a season of purification sanctification you know and um and i think this is perhaps where i'm at right now and i don't know if this is prophetic but i would think it's uh, actually i'm pretty sure it is where the body where god wants and is guiding and directing the body of christ toward right now of purification sanctification which includes purging it includes you know waking people up to the truth you know opening their spiritual eyes and ears exposing the corruption and the taintedness in the church the wickedness the witchcraft so on and so forth that is what's going on in the body of Christ right now. And, um, and so this number kind of came up again tonight. And, you know, I'm, I'm studying a certain series of teachings right now. And in the teachings that I'm studying right now, um, this, the teacher, you know, uh, what's the word I want to use? Equivocates? Is that a word? <laughs> um, you know, infirmity with sin, which is not really a, a, a novel concept. And so I was just kind of studying this tonight. I was just kind of pondering it. And the Holy Spirit told me to, you know, read a little further, you know. And so, you know, like... Most people pay attention to the part where, you know, the guy gives Jesus the excuses and Jesus, you know, doesn't even acknowledge the excuses and just tells him, like, get up, you know, get up, take up your bed and walk, take up your mat and walk. And 
What's lesser known is if you continue on in, in the passage, um, you know, this man tells the testimonies to some people, and then afterwards, Jesus finds him. And now, I mean, we don't know if Jesus, like, went out of his way to go find him, or if they just kind of happenstance upon each other, or whatever, but... It says Jesus found him in the temple, verse 14. And Jesus said to him, See, you have been made well. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. And, you know, I've heard sermons on this before, but it's not, it's not one of your, like, major sections of passage because it's, it's not popular because people don't, don't like truth. And so I kind of had to, you know, go to God again and say, Lord, what does this mean again? You know, and just kind of refresh myself. And, um, and so here's the deal. And I've made this point before on this channel, and I, I'm sure I will continue to. Most of the time, not all the time, but most of the time, Ailments in the physical body have a root cause of sin slash infirmity either in that person or that person's bloodline. Now, we all know the passage that of, of the blind man that Jesus healed his vision and the disciples said to him, Lord, was this his sin or his parents' sin? And Jesus said, neither. You know, this was just so that God could be glorified. So we know that not all cases or examples of ailment in the physical body have to do with sin slash infirmity. But those of us who have been schooled in, received revelation, so on and so forth, regarding healing and deliverance and all of that, which is what my, one of my offices is, it's one of my callings, and it's what my channel is majoritively about. We know, and I'm trying to teach the body of Christ as much as I can reach it, that most of the time, body ailments are rooted in some kind of sin that needs to be repented of, whether it's personally for that person and or their ancestors. Now, what's interesting is, okay, so let, let's go back here. It says he had an infirmity. And then over here, Jesus finds him later on and says, Sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. So to me, it seems that Jesus, it's, it's implied here that Jesus was saying that his infirmity um, was his own sin. Okay? And, I mean, this is a very serious, sobering statement that Jesus made. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. And so, I was kind of pondering on this. And what came to me as I was praying and asking for revelation was... Let me go to Hebrews. Let me move my little bookmark thing here. Hebrews uh, chapter 10, verse 26 through 27. For if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation which will devour the adversaries, the adversaries of God, okay? Um, so, I just lost my train of thought, of course. Um, so let's go back to, let me 
put my bookmark back here. So let's go back to this 38. So again, I believe this represents a season. I, I think this is parabolic. And I think it represents the appointed time, the appointed season in someone's life where Jesus comes and visits a person, encounters a person in some way, shape, or form, okay? And anytime Jesus does that, you know, your, your eyes are opened, your ears are opened, at least for that moment, you know? And it's your free will decision whether you choose to stay spiritually awake or intentionally go back to sleep. Which would be kind of apostasy, okay? And so, I guess the point that I'm supposed to make is that everyone has a moment. Everyone has an appointed time, an appointed season where Jesus presents himself to you, where truth presents himself to you, okay? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And Jesus may work a miracle for you to glorify himself, to prove himself to you, to kind of jolt you awake out of your grave. Okay? The Bible says we are, were dead in our sins. Jesus died for us while we were still dead in our sins. But then there is a warning of wisdom. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. Sin is anything that is not rooted in faith in God. And faith broken down is trusting God. Okay? So sin is rebellion. Sin is partnering with the enemy. So going back to Hebrews. Chapter 10. Verse 26. For if we sin. And we can remove the word sin and say. If we rebel. If we partner with the devil. Willfully, after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation which will devour the adversaries. Now, let me explain what I'm not saying to make a distinction. Okay, I'm not saying that if you truly receive Jesus as your Savior and you truly make him Lord. And then you, you know, occasionally, you know, sin, blah, 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 you know. Yes, of course, your sins are covered and atoned for. The point here that I believe Jesus was making was if you intentionally turn your back on God altogether... In terms of like overall. I mean we all have little moments in our walk. And, and, and whatnot, But I'm talking about. And I, I believe Jesus was talking about. Like you've been shown the truth. You've experienced the truth. Of God's power. Of God's love. Of God's mercy. And so, if you, overall, in terms of, like, a lifestyle decision, turn away from God, then there's no atonement for you. And this goes back to the, you know, the, the false doctrine of, you know, once save, will always save, blah, blah, blah. Jesus told us, remain in me and I will remain in you. It's a free will decision. If you do not remain in him, then he won't remain in you. Just the same he said, if you deny me, then I will deny you to my father in heaven. Okay. Um... 
And let, let me remind everybody, you know, that none of us is guaranteed one second from right now. You know, I mean, we never know when, I mean, look at what's been happening over the last several years. There's like sinkholes that just happen out of nowhere everywhere and stuff, you know, like, um, I saw a video, um, several months back, but some poor woman, I think it was a female, but she was, you know, her area was flooded, several feet of water, and she was walking along in the flood along a street or something, and apparently, I guess, a manhole was opened, and she got sucked down uh, into the manhole, you know, right, like, in, like, a split second, you know, like, none of us ever knows, you know, I mean, you know, car accidents, blah, 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 you know, and and sometimes people just have a straight-up heart attack out, out of nowhere, you know, I mean, none of us is guaranteed one second from right now, and so you can't take salvation for granted, and you can't take, especially if you're turning away from God, if you're, you know, partnering, if you're, <sighs> okay, so what Holy Spirit just popped in my head is, you know, regarding this whole false doctrine of one saved, always saved, you know, it's like, it's as if people believe that they can show up on the wedding day and marry Jesus. And then, like, right after the wedding reception or the honeymoon, yeah, let's say the honeymoon, they go out trampsing around with the devil again. And they don't come home and, you know, whatever. Like, that's, like, no. <laughs> like... That's, that's not abiding in Christ, you know? Um, so I didn't even have this totally ready. It just kind of developed as I was recording, which is all glory to Holy Spirit. Um, I had no idea that this was going to turn into a anti one saved, always saved message, <laughs> but I guess it did. Um, but yeah, so, I don't know, this this whole thing started off with the 38, and uh, so, purification and sanctification, you know, we all come to that appointed time, that appointed season, where the Lord is inviting us into deeper depths in our relationship with Him to purify and sanctify ourselves and it's a matter of whether you're going to cooperate. So I hope you do. I encourage you to do so. I encourage you to trust the Lord and do whatever he's leading you to do. Especially now more than ever when we are at the beginning of the end of this age. So, um, And if you're 38 or you are about to turn 38, then this may particularly hit home with you like it did for me. But I've kind of been on a journey the last few years of purifying and sanctifying, but the Lord keeps taking me deeper. Um, and like I said, I'm what I'm studying right now, I'll, I'll share with you guys soon, but it's, it's going to take us all the way, all the way into the courts and get some breakthrough finally. So... All right, I bless you all in Jesus' name.